Hey everyone, my name is Jason Costa uh, and I've been working in product uh, for many years and so I'm excited to share some things that I've learned about the craft uh, over those years with all of you. Just to give you a little bit of background on myself, uh, I studied computer science as an undergrad um, and then in 2005 I went and joined Google which uh, at the time was approximately 3600 people um, and I'm, I'm laughing about that because by the time I left it was about 27,000 four years later. Um, and I distinctly remember even when I first joined that it felt like a big company. Um, but many, many uh, fond memories of being there during that time. I went back to grad school uh, after Google. Um, and then when I finished grad school in early 2011, uh, I joined a little company called Twitter, which was about 350 people. Um, and at the time I was managing their platform offering. Um, so specifically working on their API and suite of APIs that enabled an ecosystem of more than a million different uh, apps. And then after about two years, uh, I went over to a smaller company, which was called Pinterest. And that company was less than 100 people at the time. I was one of their first two product managers on the revenue side of the house. Um, got to see that grow uh, from literally zero. We, we were making no money at the time. Uh, to well over $100 million in, in ARR. Um, in the middle of my tenure at Pinterest, after about two years, I jumped over to the consumer product team and was leading the pins team. So everything from building rich pins to video pins uh, and so on. Had a wonderful time doing that for about a year and a half and then uh, went into venture to do a quick detour for a couple of years and then came back uh, because I was really missing building product and shipping things to, to people. Um, and so I went back to join Reddit, which is an app near and dear to my heart, where I am now the director of content communities and have been working at the company for the last year and a half now. So what does a PM do anyways? It's always a fun question and one that I have often got uh, over the many years of my career that I've spent in product. And the truth is the product role is pretty malleable. It, uh, it oftentimes changes based on the company culture uh, where you work. And typically I tend to see product managers excel based on the discipline that is the, the strongest or out at the forefront of the given organization. And I'll talk a little bit more about what that means. Um, I'll use this anecdote of comparing and contrasting uh, Google and Facebook. So at Google, little design was necessary. If we think back to, and I, I started at Google uh, back in 2005 uh, as a new grad, at that time Google was really just a website. There were a couple of other collections of, of different properties, but the primary product experience was typing google.com into the browser. You would show up, you would enter in uh, you know, text into, into the text box and you would search for something. There wasn't a whole lot of, of design necessary, right? What was important and affected the user experience was the quality of the search results, uh, consistent performance, the time to interact. And so what ended up happening was the product managers at Google were extremely technical. Um, in fact, back then, uh, a Bachelor of Science in, in Comp Sci was required and a lot of the PMs at Google were former engineers themselves. So product really needed to have the respect of engineering in order to be set up for success at Google. Now Facebook, where I interned as a PM in the summer of 2010 while I was at grad school, was quite different. Their entire information architecture was, was a graph that was centered on your social relationships, uh, how you would interact and stay connected with your friends, with your family, with your colleagues, uh, and so on and so forth. So the role and the domain were far more design and, and user experience oriented. And in fact, at Facebook, at least in 2010, a lot of the PMs were actually former designers. And so in order to be set up for success again as a product manager at Facebook, you really had to have the respect of the design team. And so this is just an example and, and a comparison of sort of the two disciplines at companies that are in the consumer services sector 
but very, very different approaches in some ways to product management and the discipline of, of product management. And that expands to many other uh, different, different companies. Uh, at Apple, which I, I've never worked at, but uh, many of my friends there tell me the role is far more product marketing oriented, far more uh, GTM uh, oriented. GTM is go to market. At LinkedIn, far more business analyst heavy, right? Very, very data driven in terms of how product decisions are made. And that's that can differ according to uh, to the different shades and gradients based on the company that you work at. So I'll talk a little bit about what product doesn't do now that we've sort of expanded uh, on this concept that the, the product role is malleable. There are some things that I think definitely won't set you up for success uh, and will likely lead to organ rejection uh, if you do these things. The first is don't art direct designers, right? If you uh, show up over their shoulder and you start pointing to an element on their comp and say, this should really be a different shade of orange, it's probably not going to go well and you're probably not going to have the best relationship with these folks. And regardless of maybe which muscle or which uh, particular discipline is out at the forefront of decision making, based again on, on the uh, composition of your company, you always want to maintain very, very strong relationships with your cross-functional partners. That's true across engineering, across design, across data, and the many other disciplines that you interact with. But those three in particular are very, very important to your success as a PM. You don't want to be prescriptive with engineering. So if you're constantly uh, giving solutions to engineering with a blueprint and telling them to go do the impossible, that also is not going to lead to a healthy flourishing relationship. So you really do want to open up space both for design and for uh, engineering such that they can craft their solution and trust that they are the domain experts in their discipline, right? There's a reason why they pursued the line of work that they have, assume that they're good at it, um, and let them do what they need to do. If you're, if you're in their face and saying, you got to get this done right away, uh, it, it won't go well. PMs don't come down off the mountain with a solve, right? You, if you're just coming down and saying, this is the direction we need to go, uh, and you're dictatorial in, in the way that you sort of lead, um, this is not a way to get buy-in and enthusiasm uh, from your counterparts and from your team, right? You need to make sure that uh, you're not doing this. And we'll talk a little bit more about the right approach here later in the, the presentation. You're not the idea generator. If you're constantly throwing ideas uh, over, over the fence and sort of treating your, your design and engineering um, and your PM reports uh, as receptacles for those ideas, that also uh, is not going to, to go well. I've oftentimes seen uh, PMs who are earlier in their career take this approach. Uh, and this is, this is not a key to success. Uh, it's, it's the opposite, actually. And then lastly, I don't consider uh, PMs to be mini CEOs. I have heard this phrase thrown around in regard to the function. Um, again, I mentioned a moment ago, the PM role is not a dictatorial post. If anything, you're really an enabler and a facilitator um, of your team. And as you grow in the role, you become even more abstracted than that. You really become uh, you know, more editorial in nature. You become a curator of your team's work um, and you make sure that they're set up for success to do their best work. So I'll start to move on uh, to what is really critical for a PM. And the first thing is you really gotta, gotta know and breathe your company's mission, vision, and core user value proposition, right? And once you understand that and what the, the sort of objectives are of the company, you need to line up your products with those objectives, right? The products should flow from the mission, the vision, and the core user value proposition. And I'll give you a couple of examples of how this manifests. Google, uh, I think they made this mission statement in 1997 or 98. It would have been right around there. And it hasn't really changed. You know, it's still focused on this and everything they do 
uh, is is centered towards realizing this, right? The uh, if if you look at sort of the way that they look at YouTube, it's a search problem. If you look at the way they look at, at email and, and Gmail, it's a search problem. Uh, same thing with maps and geo, it's a search problem. Um, and even the products like Android that aren't search, uh, it, it's it's an existential matter that is tangentially related to search, right? So there's always some connection back to to the mission here. And while, while Facebook has, I believe, changed uh, their mission as of a couple of years ago, even the new mission is, is pretty close to this. It augments and expands upon this, but the, the direction has not really changed here, right? And uh, this was the mission statement, I believe, for more than 10 years at the company. And, and all of the products, again, that you see, you can very clearly map a line back uh, to this mission. I'll just share with you at, at, at Twitter, we were constantly pivoting uh, on what the sort of core user value proposition and mission were. Uh, when I first showed up there, there was a uh, talk of sort of being the lightweight identity layer of the internet. And, uh, you know, there was sort of a discussion of, could we be your business card on the internet that's dynamic, right? That's constantly populating with new information. And eventually we started to change direction. Um, and in 2011, it became about events, right? And there was this whole, hashtag NASCAR campaign, and, and it was all about that. And then it, it morphed into Twitter brings you closer. And by the time I was leaving in um, you know early to mid 2013, we had pivoted again to become the global town hall, right? And so uh, this is an area where you, you very early on want to, to conceive what that, that mission, vision, and value proposition is um, because it, it becomes harder to build products uh, if you're changing this. Likewise with Pinterest, uh, when I showed up, we were referring to the service as a discovery engine. Um, and then later we pivoted into a tool for inspiration. Uh, and then uh, when I was there again, we made a change to become a visual bookmarking tool. Right. And then by the time I was leaving uh, in late 2016, we morphed to a catalog of ideas, um, which if you think about it, really we've come back full circle to discovery engines. So when you're changing you know, what you perceive to be the nature of the product and, and the value proposition to users, it does become hard to build a consistent uh, set of products against that. So let's talk a little bit about what PMs ought to be accountable for, right? What do you need to do in your job in order to be successful? First and foremost, you really want to understand the industry landscape, right? You want to have a really good idea uh, of what's happening around you, right? And so uh, an example of this, uh, I remember uh, quite fondly when I was at, at Twitter in the early days, um, you know, we were constantly focused on the text-based interface, right, and the 140 characters, um, and that was sort of the, the spirit of a tweet. And I think that one of the critical things we missed was it was becoming increasingly apparent, um, not just from a competitive standpoint, when you think back to all the apps that were out there at that time, from, from Bourbon to Hipstamatic and so on, uh, Snapseed and et cetera, um, what was happening was imagery was starting to supersede uh, the, the interface, right? People were finding uh, more opportunities to express themselves and having more fun digesting that particular medium. Um, and so, you know, fast forward a few years later and, and you have Instagram uh, rising very, very quickly, right? We kind of missed the boat on how important uh, photos and rich media were uh, within tweets. And it, it was a little bit late by the time that we finally got there. You also want to be able to pull executive and cross-functional context together and be able to show the entire picture uh, for your team, right? And, and that doesn't mean just your immediate team, it means your extended team as well. Everybody is going to have a different snapshot or a different uh, frame by which they're viewing the elephant and they only know what they can see. It's your job to see the entire picture craft the narrative of what that picture looks like and deliver that in a very clear and concise manner for your colleagues. You wanna delve into user research and really empathize with your end users. Um, I'm always surprised at how many 
uh, folks in product that I talk to who aren't avid, uh, almost dogmatic users of their products, right? You, you need to be in the heads of your users and it extends beyond just using your product. It also includes getting out there and, and talking to folks. So I can share that uh, at Reddit where I work today, we spend a great deal of time out talking to our communities, right? We spend a lot of time talking to our moderators, um, talking to highly active users, people are constantly contributing on the site and so on and so forth. So this is a really, really critical part of the job. You have to be in the mindset of your users and understand at a very fundamental level, um, you know, what their, their habits are and uh, what they value about your service. Globally minded from, from the outset. Um, so this is incredibly important because we, we live in an internet age today where you can very quickly expand the service offering to many, many different countries. You don't need to just focus on your home market. Um, you can quickly expand. Um, and one of the amazing things about the digital era is you can deploy uh, the same day in uh, different continents in countries that uh, are on the other side of the world. And so you do have to have an understanding uh, of how other people use your service, right? We, we've kind of um, built products um, for many years now uh, against a set of Western biases. But if you go spend time, for instance, in East Asia, people use consumer services uh, as it pertains to software very, very differently. Oftentimes cashless society, um, your mobile phone is, is the wallet. Many folks have skipped uh, the desktop and gone straight to mobile. Um, some markets where ads, digital ads are incredibly nascent, you know, there are different business models. Folks uh, build businesses on top of things like digital goods and virtual gifting. So it's very important to have a holistic understanding across different markets. This is one of the critical uh, functions of the product role. You absolutely have to define very tightly, very articulately uh, what the user problem is, right? What are you trying to solve for, right? What is, what is the problem that the user is facing? Um, and oftentimes you won't necessarily just get that by talking to users, right? They, they know what is in front of them. Uh, you have to understand the problem in front of them. And you also have to understand the problem that is going to be in front of them three or four steps down the line, right? So it's a very holistic process and it does require a lot of thought. This is not an easy thing. Uh, it is both an art and a science and it can take years to develop this muscle, but it's one of the most important things you can do. And the reason why is you have to bring that very tight, uh, well-articulated problem both with qualitative and quantitative uh, material to support the problem, you have to bring that to engineering and design, right? And then you, you really want to put guardrails uh, around the process, but you want a lot of space in between those guardrails. Um, and at that point, you want to start to enable design and engineering to engage in their crafts, right? You want to enable them the opportunity to uh, go about setting out to to design and build a solution right and this is this is a you know a multiplayer game so you know you want to be in there uh soundboarding with them and you want to be in there as a thought partner um, but you also want to give them a lot of room uh, to be able to craft a solution to the problem that you framed for them and then at the end the group should come back together uh look at the the final product that you're getting ready to ship which is most likely an MVP, hopefully an MVP. Um, and you have to ask yourself at the end of the, the process, did we solve the right problem, right? Oftentimes, and you should, by the way, be asking that many times during the course of, of the product development process, but certainly uh, at that final go checkpoint uh, when you're getting ready to ship. You wanna highlight the trade-offs. You wanna have a really critical understanding here of uh, the different paths you can go down, right? And so once you get a set of solutions uh, out of discussion with your data, with your engineering and with your design counterparts, you need to come back and evaluate, all right, what are the pros and cons of each of these paths that we can take? And then which one should we pick from that? And have very clear, sober rationale to why you're, pick why you're picking a particular path. 
as a PM, you are absolutely responsible both for the quality and the pace of the decision making, right? So you, <laughs> you, it should go without saying you constantly want to be making the best decisions that you can to reach, uh, you know, the optimal impact for the company and for the business. Um, and you also want to make sure that you're time boxing decisions. Um, I, I have a lot of love for my friends in the world of design. Um, but, you know, oftentimes not to pick on that, I'm just using it as an anecdote. You know, oftentimes designers who are the most creative people in the world uh, can, can kind of wander off into the forest and get lost. And uh, there's a cost to that. And that cost is time, right? And, and if you're not moving fast, the competition certainly will be. Um, and if, if you're competing for something meaningful, uh, you know, it, it is a race and you have to treat it as such. And so you do want to make sure that you're bringing people back together frequently in order to ensure uh, that you're shipping. Cross-functional coordination and alignment. This is uh, uh, what I jokingly like to refer to as, you know, the, the herding cat, uh, herding cats uh, part of the job. And so, you know, you do have to constantly be ensuring that well beyond just your immediate team, uh, that your extended, you know, family, if you will, uh, is also bought in and aligned on what you're, you're building. Um, and so that means making sure that you're lined up with legal, you're lined up with policy, you're lined up with the user operations team. If you get too far down the process and legal comes to you at the 11th hour and says, you didn't talk to me about this and you're violating, you know, XYZ copyrights and we're going to get sued. Guess what? That's your bad. Uh, likewise, if you go at the 11th hour and talk to your user operations team and they start to realize that what you're launching is going to introduce an avalanche of support requests that's well beyond the capacity of their team. Guess what? Like you're on the hook for that. And so you do want to be out in front of this constantly. Um, and while it feels like a lot of overhead and it feels like a lot of unnecessary communication, it will be well worth it when you do get to that 11th hour and there are no loose ends. You want to define metrics that really measure success. This is also an art and a science. Um, you want to sit down in particular with your partners on the data front and you really want to pick metrics that accurately reflect your strategy uh, and that at the end of the day can tell you if you're executing successfully against your strategy. So this is a really, really critical piece um, and it's not easy to do, but spend the time up front making sure that how you're going about measuring your progress on things uh, is, is accurate and contains a lot of signal. You absolutely got to ship. Uh, if you've ever been to Japan and you've ridden on the Shinkansen, uh, it is amazing. They, they will tell you when the trains are arriving down to the minute. And you want to have a similar uh, operational excellence on your team. You want to have that level of discipline. And so when you make a commitment to shipping uh, on a particular date, you want to do everything you can to honor that commitment, right? And once you do that consistently, uh, you build up a sense of trust with the rest of the organization and folks know that they can depend on you, that what you say uh, is going to happen, right? So this is a really, really important thing in particular to work very closely with your engineering counterpart on. You want to ensure uh, that things are arriving at the time that you said that they would. And uh, it's not a stretch to say it's healthy to be a maniacal uh, PM about this. You want to have long horizons and many milestones. And uh, what I mean by that is oftentimes, in particular with PMs that are new to the function, they, they get very attracted to the new shiny object. And I think one of the things about the craft that's really important is you you, you do need to spend a lot of time uh, on a product and oftentimes you can, you can fail at it a couple of times. If you look at Square, if they had just given up after Square Wallet, they would have never stumbled upon Cash App, right? At some point they said, we're going to sunset the wallet, but we still have conviction that there is something in this space that we can go do uh, with excellence and users are going to value it. And then they built Cash App. 
So you have to have long horizons, right? Oftentimes it can take two, three, four years, uh, even longer sometimes to find product market fit. You wanna have milestones along the way, but you do wanna make sure that, you know, if you're just shipping something, <coughs> excuse me, and moving on uh, to, to the next thing, three months later, six months later, you're probably not doing everything you could to set the product up for success. Lastly, savor the wins. There's little things that are gonna happen um, and oftentimes they happen during intense uh, moments uh, or even sustained moments of pressure. And uh, the PM job is hard. You know, it's a lot of work. If it was, if it was easy, everybody would be doing it. Um, and there are definitely days where you're gonna feel like you're failing. You're gonna feel like you're not good at the job. Uh, and then little things like this will happen where uh, it will, bring immense joy to you because you're working on a service that enables these magical little moments. And I distinctly remember at Twitter, uh, you know, we were very blessed in that these types of moments happen quite frequently. Uh, you know, and this, this was an example where Drake went on and, and very confidently said the first million is the hardest. And then T. Boone Pickens, who is an oilman uh, and a billionaire who lives out of Texas, came back and quoted Drake and said, actually the first billion uh, is a hell of a lot harder. And that these two <laughs> very different human beings could be interacting with one another uh, on this service. I mean, I, I remember bumping into colleagues in the hallway talking about this and being like, can you believe it? Can you believe that we get to work on this product where things like this are happening on a daily basis? So really take the time to savor these wins. This is in some sense, um, you know, the highest form of, of validation when you work on a product that enables magical moments that a lot of people can partake in. And so with that, I want to say thank you so much for taking the time. I really appreciate you listening to my talk. And uh, if you would like to read more, uh, you can visit my website, jasoncosta.org, where I chat quite a bit about all things uh, product and strategy. Thanks so much. Thank you.